Welcome, everyone. Um, this is our third Interprofessional Experiences webinar that we've had this spring. And today, Dr. Michael Timms, Dr. Stephanie Munez, and me, Liz Lipsky, will be speaking about how we reframe research. What seems important to me about this is that there's such a lack of good research on the work that all of us do, and we really need to show that what we do works and that it's cost effective and that people aren't being hurt and that it's additive to conventional medicine or can sometimes replace conventional medicine in what we do. And in order to do that, we need to have research because that's what drives the changes in how healthcare is performed in this country. If you don't know all of us, um, Stephanie Munez is really our director of research. Um, she has probably some fancy title, but she directs research for all of us at MUYH, and she's also a yoga therapy researcher. Um, Dr. Michael Tim um, has been the chair of our herbal programs for a long time, and he is the, the kind of the creator of our new uh, degree in how you actually make herbal medicines for industry and what's involved in that. And Dr. Timms has also really brought our, our dispensary up to federal standards for good manufacturing practices and um, has just such a wealth of uh, knowledge and research. And then I'm Liz Lipsky and um, I'm the Director of Academic Development for the Nutrition Programs at MUIH and a clinical nutritionist. So that said, um, here we go, and Dr. Munez, it's uh, your opportunity to share some information with us about collaborative research. Thanks, Liz. And do I have a way to be able to advance these slides, or do I have to ask you to do that? Um, let me give the remote control to you. You got it. Okay. And then what do I do to click it for? Oh, there we go. Oh, how do I go back? There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, when we're talking about interprofessional communication, interprofessional collaboration, as we aim to live up to our name of being truly integrative healthcare providers and, and integrative practitioners, policymakers, researchers, et cetera, I think it's interesting to think about whether or not research at its core is necessarily collaborative, um, or perhaps that it's best when it's collaborative, it is certainly possible to execute small research projects as an individual. And there are examples in all of our fields where that happens. But the larger and more complex the project it get, gets, the, uh, the more varied the expertise needs to be in order to do the project justice. And some of what we're all going to be talking about today is when and how research can and should be collaborative, how you go about, um, you know, thinking about the, the expertise that's necessary. And specifically, to Liz's point, I think where integrative health professionals fit into research overall, because historically, a lot of research in our practices has been done by people who don't practice our disciplines themselves. And so sometimes in the, the research courses here at MUIH or in journal club, student journal club or faculty journal club, we read articles and we think, well, you would never do it like that in real life. You know, that's not how it's actually practiced or, you know, in acupuncture, the way they chose those points didn't make sense or because the voices were not necessarily at the table from our disciplines on the team to inform the way that the research was designed and evolved. So while something like maybe a literature review or a case report can be done by an individual, I think even those are informed by broader teams with varied expertise. A few years ago, I was uh, speaking with a faculty member who was new, somewhat new to research and was asked, well, you know, doesn't it look better if I'm the only author on the paper? And my response was, 
actually, I think it looks better if there's a team because then as a reader, I trust that there are varied perspectives uh, that are involved in the work and even in the reporting of the work. So when a research study is being designed, I think there are a few different kinds of expertise that you may want to think about. One is the intervention. And so that's what many of us do. The intervention is the nutrition or the herbs or the yoga therapy or the health coaching. So you want somebody who understands the intervention that's going to be delivered so that it's designed appropriately. Then you probably want someone who understands the population. So for example, if the population is adolescents with ADHD or the population is women with breast cancer or the population is older adults with early onset dementia or whatever, whoever your population is, you want someone who understands and maybe that's the same person. I happen to have expertise in both yoga therapy and arthritis. But if I'm going to do a project that is a yoga therapy project for another population, I want that expertise at the table. And then methodologically. Uh, so oftentimes when somebody is thinking about doing a different kind of study, they may not realize that they really need somebody who has expertise in that involved in the process. So if you are designing a survey, do you have somebody who has expertise in survey methodology? If you're designing a qualitative study that has in-depth interviews or focus groups, do you have somebody on the team who has done that kind of research and knows how to write up the script for the interview or how to train people in those skills for research interviews, et cetera? And then the statistics, because once you've gathered the data, you want to make sure that the analysis plan that's designed for that data is appropriate and that the analysis is executed according to the plan or that the plan is adjusted as, as it needs to be. And then administrative, because especially when you're dealing with a larger research team or you're dealing with different sites or you're dealing with lots of participants, you need somebody who's going to be the hub and hold all of that together. And in some cases, that's the principal investigator or sort of the, the lead on the project. And in many cases, there's someone who's a research assistant or a research coordinator who's helping to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed administratively. So, um, so when we talk about research that's integrative, I think that, you know, the, the terminology in our fields has shifted over time. Originally, it was alternative medicine, and then it became complementary and alternative medicine. And now it's moved more to integrative health or complementary and integrative health practices. And the key to me between complementary and integrative, complementary practices happen side by side and they complement each other, but they're not integrated. They're not interwoven. They're not working together. In my mind, integrative health is when those disciplines are not just co-occurring and maybe benefiting from the co-occurrence, but they're actually working together. And so in healthcare practices, maybe that means that the functional medicine doctor is speaking with the health coach or sharing notes or plans. And from a research perspective, I think it means having all of those voices at the table, not just as an add-on, but from the very beginning, from the very inception of the idea. And I think you know, Michael and I are probably going to talk about some examples here of what happens when that doesn't occur. And when some voices at the table are stuck on, you know, as icing or dressing as opposed to being truly integrated into the research process. Um, and I, I think also it's important to consider not just what the expertise is, but also the lens. Um, because we all come with biases, we all come with perspectives, we all come with um, the ways that we see the world, the experience that we've had. And as researchers, we do what we can to account for that bias and to reduce the influence of that bias. But the way that qualitative researchers think about it is we want that lens. We want that point of view. We just want to balance it by having varied perspectives involved in the process. And so I think that perhaps because it really lends itself to collaboration and integrative integration, 
that research can be one way that we come out of our silos in our respective disciplines and reach out to people who are working in other sectors in order to better integrate. Uh, and I'm going forwards and backwards here, apologies for that. Okay, so as the chair of the MUHIRB, it would be irresponsible of me to not mention this. So for those of you who are unaware, an IRB is an institutional review board. All universities that conduct research have an IRB, and the IRB's job is to make sure that research is ethical. So some of you in your coursework may have learned about times in history where research was conducted unethically. And because of that, there are both federal and international guidelines for assuring that human subjects, people who participate in research studies, are treated ethically. And there are a whole bunch of guidelines for that happening, and I'm not gonna get into that, but I just want to raise this point as we're encouraging people to think about what kinds of research might you be able to do or collaborate on or, um, or, or seek out opportunities for, that any research that involves a human subject has to get either approval or exemption from an IRB. And many people think that that means, oh, well, if I'm doing experiments on people, you know, if I'm um, exposing people to this drug versus that drug or a drug or a, versus a placebo, that that is research that involves human subjects. But it's really any research that involves the data of human subjects. So even if you ask people questions on a survey, that can be human subjects research. If you observe somebody's behavior uh, and collect that data for research purposes, that's research. So think more broadly about, you know, is this data that is coming from people? And the, the safest way to approach it is just to reach out to the IRB and say, hey, I am thinking about doing this project. Do I need IRB approval to do so? Uh, and just a heads up, so, there are independent IRBs that are outside of universities, and every university's IRB is a little bit different. Ours at MUIH requires a faculty principal investigator. Um, so if you have an interest in a project, you'd have to be working with a faculty member in order to go through the IRB. And for more information about this, I put the sort of the way to get to the IRB page here. If you log in and go to my MUIH and then click on the academics tab at the top, you'll go down to research and to the IRB and you'll see all the information you need there. Hey, Stephanie. Yeah. Um, I wonder, um, for, for some of the students who have never experienced this, it's a wonderful um, exposure to the intricacies and the amount of detail necessary to kind of go into research. Is there a, a place for them to come to an IRB meeting as a non-voting visitor and just experience it? Or are there some concerns about uh, disclosure that maybe would prevent that. Um, we have not explored having visitors to the IRB, and there might be some confidentiality issues around that, especially because some of the projects have student investigators on them. So from a FERPA perspective, like if the proposal has been designed as some part of somebody's coursework, then it would be having other students look at each other's coursework in a sense. So... Um, it might be possible to do that for projects that don't involve any student investigators and with certain permissions, but that's something we'd have to look into further. And I, I'm not sure what the precedent is for that at other institutions, but that's something we could explore. Stephanie, you know, for me, as when I was a doctoral student, one of the things about going through an IRB process and actually doing research, it gave me such respect for what goes into doing research and how intricate it is and how, even though we try to be completely objective, how much subjectivity there is in a final research conclusion. Um, and I think it's a wonderful process to be involved in, even as somebody who only 
reads research to get a greater insight into how research is done. Absolutely. And Liz, I think you raise an important point about, you know, that we aim to remove our bias and that it's still there. So um, there's a course that I've taught a couple of times that you're aware of where students in the DCM program are developing an IRB application. And um, what I often see is um, their bias showing because of course, we believe that our practices work because otherwise we wouldn't be exploring them. We wouldn't be becoming clinicians in a field that we didn't believe in. But if I, as a yoga therapist, am assuming that the intervention I'm going to deliver is going to have positive outcomes, that is a bias. And it comes out in the language of the proposal when, because as scientists, so, you know, this is where the the lens of a scientist and the lens of a clinician may differ. As a scientist, we want to look at a, a research endeavor with curiosity and objectivity to the extent possible. So I want to look at a research project and think, hmm, I'm really curious to see what happens if X, Y, or Z. And I actually think about that. I um, have an artist background as well. And I think that that's something that the sciences and the arts share. It's what if, what if I tried this? What if I added that? What if we did it this way instead? And it's a curiosity as opposed to an agenda of, I'm going to prove that what I do has this effect and then people will take me seriously and then they will refer to me and then we will change policy. All of those things might happen, but it, we as scientists want to think about, well, what if somebody does yoga once a week instead of twice a week? Or what if they take this dose of the herb instead of that dose of the herb? Or what if, you know, we try this diet on this population instead of that population? So that not only can we answer new questions, but we can optimize our care. So instead of this broader question of, does it work? Well, how does it work? Why does it work? How does it work best? What can we do to optimize our treatments for the greatest effect? Okay, so I'm going to give an example of um, a couple collaborations. So one of them, there, there was a study that I did at Johns Hopkins um, in my area of yoga for people with rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. And there was a group at NIH that wanted to study yoga for arthritis in underserved minorities. So instead of starting from scratch and creating a yoga program that they thought would be appropriate for this population, they came to me as somebody who had already designed such a project. So they had their own research team at NIH. NIH has plenty of trained and experienced researchers in all different areas. But instead of considering themselves to know enough to develop a new program, they thought, well, what has already been done? Because research is iterative. Everything that we do builds on what's happened before. And so before we're, anyone is doing a project, you want to look back to review the literature and figure out what is already known and how does the project I want to do fit into the existing body of literature. And they thought, well, let's take this program that we already know has been associated with all of these various health improvements and let's see what happens if we offer that same program for underserved minorities with arthritis. But then they had to think about, well, what would we need to change about the program in order to make it appropriate for this new population. Instead of just assuming that it's gonna be a direct transfer, remember I said that population is an important factor to consider. So they brought me into the research team and they also had experts looking at, you know, how do we make sure that there is cultural competency, that there is language competency, that the the images are relevant and appropriate, that the way that we're communicating is relevant and appropriate for this new population. And this was a study that only involved 30 people, and it was not even a randomized control trial, just enroll 30 people, give them yoga, measure to see what happens. And that research team had 
14 researchers on it. So 30 people taking yoga, you might think, well, that's pretty straightforward. It was a multi-year process that involved a lot of perspectives in order to get that nuance right of how do we take into consideration the arthritis population, the yoga expertise, underserved minorities, Spanish language speakers, et cetera. So that's one example of a collaborative research team. And then another example is, um, and as I think Michael's gonna be sharing as well, a situation where perhaps the expertise was not brought in um, immediately as it should have been. So there's a project that I'm working on right now that builds on prior acupuncture research. The acupuncture research originally looked at the difference between individual acupuncture that happens one-on-one -on -one and group acupuncture where multiple people are being treated in the same room. And what they found, and this was for underserved minorities with chronic pain, that the group acupuncture was also effective. And what that means is that in underserved minority populations where funding and cost can be an issue, it can be effective to pay one practitioner to treat multiple people simultaneously, therefore making it more scalable and bringing down the cost. But what was reported by the acupuncturist throughout that study is these people really need to move. And so once that study was completed, the next research question they had, because remember that research is iterative, was what if they do yoga after they get acupuncture? And what they were originally gonna do is copy an existing yoga protocol, as I had mentioned happened in the previous study. However, the protocol they were gonna copy was for low back pain and their population had chronic pain that was much more diverse. So what they hadn't thought about is how the yoga might need to be different for chronic pain in general or individualized for chronic pain in general compared to the use of a low back pain protocol. And it wasn't until they had already acquired funding and had the, uh, the, the research study planned out that they thought, you know what, let's just check with a yoga researcher. So they, they consulted with me and I said, I really think you need a yoga expert on the team. Uh, and after a little while and me talking with the whole group a few times, they realized, oh yeah, we probably should have brought you in at the beginning. Um, and so what I was able to do as the yoga expert on that was develop a yoga program that was appropriate for all kinds of chronic pain by making it individualized to each specific person so that it wasn't one protocol that everyone would get because everyone was going to come in with different needs. And that is another study where you have the acupuncture piece that needs to be designed by acupuncturists. You have to hire acupuncturists to deliver it. You have me designing the yoga. I had to bring in a bunch of yoga providers. You have all of the expertise that you need on the research side in terms of the statistics and the methodologist and it's mixed methods. So you need the quantitative and qualitative expertise. It's, it's at three hospitals. So you need people who are going to you know, jump through all the hoops for hospital oversight. And so this ends up being 20 people, more than 20 people on a research team, again, for a study that is not even a randomized control trial. It's a feasibility study just to see if this model works and then maybe to, to do something bigger as a randomized controlled trial. So it speaks to how something that we think of as a simple question, what if we add yoga to the acupuncture, actually ends up being really complex and where we have an opportunity to bring our disciplines in an appropriate way so it informs the literature so that we're not complaining that the literature doesn't look like the way we think it should look, but we're part of it shaping how the research studies happen. And a couple more examples here. So even for theoretical papers, for literature reviews, for surveys, you know, you rarely ever see a single author on these kinds of things. And these are some examples of things that, that we've done um, with Marlisa Sullivan, who's a faculty member at MUIH, uh, a, a 
paper here that's theoretical, another that's a survey, another that's a lit review, and they all involve, for each of these, I could tell you specifically what the expertise is of each member on the team that was essential in informing the process. So my advice in general to students or to faculty who are just getting started with research, whatever your idea is, it is probably much bigger than what is a reasonable first step. And so, you know, with the, the student projects that we've been working on, that is, I'm sure it's frustrating to students, but from experience, we know that it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and resources even to do what seem like very simple projects. So whatever your idea is, shrink it down and think about what is the very first step that I could do on the journey toward answering this bigger question. And oftentimes that just starts with a review of the existing literature to know what's already been done. So I'm not replicating prior efforts and you know, reinventing the wheel. And you might consider consulting a career researcher who works in your area to find out, is this reasonable? Can I expect to accomplish this in the amount of time that I have with the resources that I have? Um, and think about each study, not necessarily being life-changing and groundbreaking for the world of research in your field, but that each study, each little project that you execute adds one piece to an emerging jigsaw puzzle. So if you think about a puzzle, each little piece adds a little bit more until what the picture looks like starts to take shape. And so as you think about, you know, bringing your big idea down to something smaller, think about what your expertise is, what you bring to the table, and therefore what expertise you might need to bring in from other people in order to round out your team. Conversely, instead of starting with the idea and putting together a team, you can start with the team and figure out where the overlap in your expertise is and figure out, you know, is anything missing from this team that we would need. An example is that we had some researchers from Brazil come up and they have expertise in infrared therapy. We have expertise in yoga and we thought, well, what happens if we combine yoga and infrared therapy? So you can think about it from the team perspective first. All right, and then if you have questions, I'm sorry, I'm flipping through clumsily. Feel free to reach out to me, to the IRB, if you have questions there, to your department chair or to experienced researchers in your department. And with that, I will turn it over to Michael. Thanks. I'm actually not gonna cover Scutellaria biclinensis in uh, particular, but it's a beautiful photo. Um, I think what I'm going to look at is, um, and um, if I can get someone to actually move the slide forward, that would be great. Um, I'm going to uh, cover sort of a series of issues that need to be thought about um, in research. And these are my own experiences, uh, experiences on the RV looking at uh, these um, uh, the uh, different projects that are coming through to sort of see what uh, students are trying to package together as a research approach. Um, so though the, the list, I'm not going to necessarily point out where one occurs over another, um, but you'll see this is a good place to start. My background um, is more in uh, benchtop research and product, product development, but I have run a clinical trial before um, and have experience on the IRB. So I'll really speak to both in the herb world. And there were two things that... Um, uh, I think that Stephanie said in particular that resonate with me, and that is the, the lack of understanding of people out in the world conducting clinical trials and research on herbs about the herbs themselves, their complexity, all kinds of issues. And I'll note those as we go through this list. The other is, I think, uh, the skill set of being able to deconstruct a big idea into its requisite smaller pieces is honed over time. It's not a skill you start out with. And um, one of the best ways to learn that is to have a, a team of people you go to who are strength that you don't have, they're experts, 
you can talk to them about the nature of what you're trying to do. Uh, because when you look at a, a lab that's done phenomenal work, and I would, uh, I, I'll, um, I'll show my cards a little bit here. I don't think we do research as well anymore as we used to. Um, some of that has to do with the way that uh, funding skews research. I don't think we're as innovative as we used to be. We don't take the chances we do. The, the funding agencies really are playing it safe, and that's showing up in the nature of the research that we produce. Um, but that said, um, I think um, that idea of starting small and figuring out if you want to get to Z, how can you back that up? How can you take steps backwards into uh, the pieces that are missing? Uh, can you go out and find the pieces? Sometimes you can do the kind of lit reviews and um, meta-analysis to set the stage for what needs to be done, right? That's what ends all papers. Next steps should be, and so you want to be thinking that way. So I would urge you to go here to this con, uh, consolidated standards of reporting trials, and uh, Stephanie will mention some other resources later. But um, really, the piece that um, do I have control now? I'm not able to move this. I'm viewing your screen, Liz. I had a little trouble with it, Michael. You have to bring your um, cursor to the bottom and click, and then it shows up. Okay. Um, I, can I come back to this one right here? This is something I think you put in for the equator. Yeah, Liz is going to talk about that later. Okay. Um, uh, you have control, Liz. Sorry, I was uh, trying to get it where you wanted it and then just lost everything. Sorry. Um, so, Michael, I only had one slide from you with that one. Okay. Well, um, I do have the original slides that I sent on, um, and I can bring that up if you give me control. Okay. Will do. You have control. Isn't that on some sort of movie? Or am I thinking of Rod Steiger and um, The Outer Limits? <laughs> um, let's see. We'll let you share your screen. It's not showing up on the bottom, the share screen. Oh, let me stop my share, and then maybe you can start your share. Yeah. Oh gosh, if I can just get it there. You know, we are in the 21st century and uh, it's just a little bit wiggy. All right. Okay, Michael. Thank you, you very share. much. I'm gonna fly through some slides here. So here's just a list, not particularly elegant, but there you have it. Um, and this came out of the consort statement and I've thrown in some of my own things. Um, and um, if you're doing research on a product that's already out there, right, you need product name. The Latin binomial obviously is important because common names can exist across different cultures and they don't particularly identify the plant. Uh, the plant part, you'd be amazed the number of studies that don't actually tell you what part is being used. And to some extent, when they've done research on things like echinacea, uh, there might be four different species that are in trade and used and actually have different phytochemical fingerprints. So if they don't identify that piece, they don't identify two species, then you're really, um, you're not sure you're, you're of the research, what the end product really says. Uh, the type of product, is it fresh or dry? And you think to yourself, well, why should that matter? Well, you get decomposition of some compounds. Um, you get um, some compounds that are actually byproducts of the drying process, and they all may be active. And so something like a fresh juice in echinacea has a different phytochemical fingerprint than a dried 
uh, ethanol uh, water extract. Um, you want to be able to link back to some sort of voucher specimen. And this is important because this is a, the original source of um, how this got identified. Either a company has it on, on, um, uh, on tap or you've gone out, if you yourself have, are, are doing product development, um, you've gone to a grower or you're growing it on as part of your own vertical integration in your company, you need to be able to take a voucher specimen, identify it. So it's on the premises and says, this is the plant that we're using. This is how I identified it. Um, if you're extracting, and this could be just a um, hydro alcohol extraction, it could be an extraction where you're actually going to powder and you're beginning to uh, increase the level of uh, focus on standardized compounds. In either case, you need the concentration of that. That might be a liquid to plant material ratio. Um, it could be a um, um, set of milligrams of a certain compounds that are being extracted. And when we talk about authentication methods, these are methods um, that have been used to measure the presence of compounds or the lack of adulterants or the lack of contaminants. And so you want to be able to um, get into the Q&A of that company uh, if you're using a product or your own and understand how have they ensured um, that the, the plant and the compounds they say are there are there and what they've done to ensure that there, are, there aren't, there aren't um, pharmaceuticals that are present um, in, in many respects in, from some of the marketplaces outside the U.S. Uh, right now who don't have as stringent um, of sort of regulatory control. You're getting products that are coming in that have pharmaceuticals in them. And so you need to be able to uh, understand the QA processes to ensure what's coming in. Dosage and duration are rational for um, these. Where, what's your source? And this is really important because what I see in the herbal marketplace, um, you see a bifurcation. And that is, to some extent, there's information on the science and data side about dosing. But a lot of the dosing information we get are from traditional sources. It might be uh, textbooks from the eclectic movement, it might be current well-known herbalists that have done a lot around uh, understanding dosage forms, um, but they don't show up in the literature. And so most folks who, who put together trials who aren't used to digging into the secondary sources of information aren't going to know that. Um, and so you tend to get the same dosing regimens repeated over and over and over because it's just sort of assumed that everything has been worked out here. And so you, you just see them um, in, in multiple tests. And what would be interesting would be if you had a series of trials that had um, different dosing regimens by choice, and then you could actually begin to do a systematic review of all of them and pull out some data to show either there is no dosing effect or there is a dosing effect. Um, I think I talked about the QA and um, good manufacturing status. This is really around purity testing. Um, if you're going to be using a, a, um, uh, a filler, uh, you know, you may want to look at uh, what's in there. Uh, there are cases where things like uh, stearic acid, uh, some of the um, uh, titanium dioxide, a number of other fillers that are used in the manufacturing process. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to make sure that things don't clump together that there's the dispersal of the plant material uh, in a homogenous way through the uh, encapsulation process so you get a standardized amount. Well, they can actually have an impact on the side effect side of things. And so you'd want to research the fillers involved if you're using a product off the shelf. Um, if you're getting a standardized um, product, and by that I mean um, there are companies that will standardize. You see in ginkgo biloba, you'll see the flavonoids and terpenes standardized to 24 and 6%. Excuse me for a minute. I have a chocolate lab begging my attention. No, Gibson. Stop. Lay down. Down. He is such a punk. Sorry about that. 
Do you want to say hello to people? Here, say hello, Giddy. Say hello. All right. Sorry about that. He is my my uh, one of my companions here. There are two other dogs. Um, so the idea of standardization in the herb market really comes from the pharmaceutical uh, frame of reference. It makes sense if you know that the markers that you're standardizing to are actually the actives. In most cases, that's not true. But from a manufacturing point of view, if you can pinpoint a compound and follow it through the manufacturing process, then you can say something about the consistency of your manufacturing process. But you haven't necessarily given evidence that this is now a more active um, phytochemical preparation. So I would be wary that standardization is, is an improvement um, unless the company has done some work to show you, okay, these standardized phytochemicals, they actually make a difference. We need to see more of those and we need to see them at these percentage levels. Um, the other thing would be any kind of chemical fingerprint or method used to assure that um, all the compounds are there. And, and you say to yourself, well, why should that matter? Well, something like echinacea, you can have two crops in a single growing season. That second crop of echinacea flowers and leaves actually will not have certain compounds like the chicoric acid, which is sort of necessary as part of that um, emulogical um, uh, fingerprint. And in other cases, you can get the raw material re-extracted. So you can get something like ginseng, um, which is actually um, uh, shown to, um, if, if they uh, extract it a second time, um, you have the material that looks an awful lot like the original. Organoleptically, it smells like it. Um, who let the dogs out? I'm seeing a wolf up here. And uh, so I, I think these are all important. And somehow I've moved forward when I didn't want to do that. I was trying to open up the, uh, the chat box to see if I'm missing anything. Yeah, I have two cats too. The, um, uh, they're not around right now. Sorry, I messed that up trying to open up the chat. Um, the other piece I think that um, we ran into was placebo. So there was a group putting, and this is um, uh, uh, in the DCN program, and they were trying to put together a placebo. And I've worked with the, with the dispensary at this point, so they're set up to do this. Um, and I'm not involved in the, the dispensary on a day-to-day -day basis anymore, so I can't really uh, speak to it. But when you deal with placebos, even in a capsule form, right, you want placebos often for control arm. Uh, you need them to have the similar organoleptic signature. So if you get something like valerian and you're going to do a tr clinical trial on valerian, for any of you that have ever uh, looked at valerian, you know that um, it's stinky. It smells like old gym socks. And I know you're sitting there thinking, well, how does he know that? <laughs> we won't go into that. Just use your imagination. I have daughters who've never had to deal with brothers. So I throw my socks at them and I ask them, do these smell? And um, they, they squeal and they are angry. But you know what? I think it's really important for them to have to deal with that. Just, I feel like that's one of my roles in life. So Valerian, how are you going to put together a placebo for that? How are you going to have something that has that smell? That's a little bit harder, but you can do others. So if you're dealing with something like uh, the scutellary biclinensis, if you're dealing with aerial portions, you can get other aerial born herbs that might have a similar signature close enough where there isn't some kind of outstanding smell or taste that you can now um, have a mimic of. Nobody. Um, and um, so that's, that's something if you want to do that internally, I would go down to the dispensary or work with them virtually and say, look, this is what we're going to test. We want to find some inert or similar signature um, and they can do the work for you. Now there, there'll be a cost for their time. And so again, this goes back to planning 
your budget, et cetera. But they can work with you to identify um, a, uh, um, a uh, placebo. The other thing, I think Gibson wants out. So I'm going to keep talking. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to disappear to, to let him out. But the, uh, the other part would be, we've done work. I, I've done outreach. And I'm glad to do this for anyone that wants to do this internally with companies uh, to get their product line. So uh, if you wanted to use, do a test on Golden Seal, um, we would work with a company to say, look, we're doing a cl um, clinical trial internally with our students. Um, this is what they're doing. Would you be willing to donate uh, so many products and uh, so many products of a placebo? We've identified this placebo. Um, so that would be the, the other piece. Also, if you're putting together a, a trial, um, I would strongly urge that you bring in <laughs> Gibson boy. He is pushing. I, I'm going to have to run in a second. Um, bring in a, a strong herbalist. Um, if, if it's clinically oriented, find someone on staff that's doing this kind of clinical work. Um, if you want feedback from myself or um, from uh, uh, Joanne Gibbons, who sort of was our QA specialist, and she teaches in the uh, QA GMP course. Um, there are lots of uh, lots of different types of expertise internally, and do that earlier than later. This is that think it through piece. This is that piece that says start from the beginning, bring in some people on your on your group that are just good problem solvers. They're the sort that drive you crazy because they go, well, what about this? Oh, geez, not that, not that, right? No, you want that. You want them pushing and needling your thinking so that you you get it all worked out. And you may decide, no, that's not important because the focus is over here. But you want as much as possible to anticipate what you're going to run into. Because going through the process of actually doing the experiment, the experiment has an amazing way of talking back to you saying, nope, you screwed up, didn't work. Because you were going to fail. That's the other part of this. Um, you're going to fail nine times out of ten. And so fail on small pilot projects, fail on little things to kind of work out the bigger issues, fail in not anticipating something so that when you get to the real thing that you're doing, you've done an awful lot to ensure that you're going to be successful. So um, these are, are, are now I, I can send this information out too. These are two texts that go over the different types of um, uh, information you need in a randomized control trial and for anything else that I discussed if uh, you want to follow up um, you can get a hold of me really easily at mtims at muih so I'm going to give this back to so Michael go take your dog out the yes, poor thing I <laughs> hope I don't have to clean up anything uh, so I'll just add very quickly to thank you, Michael. That was excellent. Um, what Michael presented there, that long list of considerations, though that is the extension to consort that is specifically for herb research. Uh, so consort, these are reporting guidelines. This is when you're going to write up a study, here are the things that you need to report about it. And consort is for randomized controlled trials in general, but there's an extension to that that's specifically for herbs. There's also an extension to that that's specifically for acupuncture. And um, those are the stricta guidelines. We're actually in the process of developing an extension for yoga because it doesn't exist. So within integrative health, there are lots of considerations of what needs to be decided and reported that are different from drug trials. And this website that Liz put on here, the Equator Network, is where you find all of those guidelines. So you can see here that for an observational study, you're going to use the strobe guidelines. For uh, a systematic review, you're going to use the PRISMA guidelines. And before you even design your study, it's good to look at what are the kinds of things that I'll be needing to report that I need to think through. And Michael just did a great job of walking us through in detail what those are from an herbs perspective, but they also exist for our other disciplines and for research that happens outside of the randomized controlled trial type of design. And Liz is gonna say a little bit about this for case reports. 
Great. So, um, so you can see that one of the guidelines here is called case reports or the care guidelines. And these were put together um, by an international group of research scientists who are interested in case reports. And David Riley headed up this coalition and he teaches case reports at MUIH and elsewhere. And you can go to the website to see the care checklist of what you need to include in a case report and how to create a timeline. So someone first came to see you and they complained about X, Y, Z, and then you create a plan, you document that plan, and you see what changes over time in terms of their symptoms and how they feel. And um, one of the things that I love about case reports is that it, it offers students and faculty at MUIH and our alumni kind of an easy way to dabble into research and to get something published. And we're using it quite a lot in the DCN program. And um, most of the DCN students have uh, worked collaboratively together and many of their cases have been published. So it's a, a kind of an easy way. And one of the things that I love also is that Dr. Riley discusses that there are various case reports of, uh, of different kind of drugs that have been used in a kind of an off-label fashion. And by publishing a single case report, it's changed the standard of care for that particular health issue. Um, so by publishing case reports, we have an opportunity to kind of stand out and say, okay, well, for migraines, instead of giving people drugs to prevent or, or halt a migraine, that we can work on blood sugar regulation, or we can demonstrate that in this one person that it was their hypothyroid and their blood sugar dysregulation with hypoglycemia, and plus a magnesium insufficiency or B6 insufficiency that in this particular person were actually triggering their migraines. And that once they learn how to modulate and live their lives and kind of compensate for those things and maybe take some, you know, snack frequently and see a physician and get their thyroid regulated and take extra magnesium and B6 and eat magnesium and B6 rich foods that over time that this person's migraines vanished. And when we can put that into the literature, even a single case report, what we do is anybody who reads it starts thinking, huh, you know, I never really thought about those considerations in my patients with migraines. Maybe I'll start looking for those things. So this is a really simple way that we can jump into research and something that's available to you now. And the care guidelines are not that difficult. And again, even with the case report, it's nice to have a team of two or three people so that you're looking at it, you're uh, editing each other's work, you're making sure that you're not missing anything. Having teams is always um, great. And a case report is something you can also do on your own uh, if you look at the care checklist very carefully you understand how to create a timeline carefully, and you follow the rules. And um, in designing research, a lot, as Stephanie and Michael have been talking about, is how do we design it so that we get the best outcome? And how we do that is we having the right people on a team, and by following the rules of what people have put together as what's mandatory for a specific type of research. With that, what I'd love to do is open it up to um, questions and comments from those of you who are on the call. So um, you're welcome to unmute yourself. I've pretty much muted everyone, but you can unmute yourself and ask directly, or you can put something in the chat box and we'll be able to see it. I'm trying to find. I'll, I'll add to what you said, Liz, in terms of case reports that um, oftentimes 
you know, a clinician will observe one thing in this clinic and some other clinician observes something similar in another clinic. And it's by publishing case reports that we can start to notice a pattern among these different cases. And those case reports can inform the larger trials that end up getting done because they're hinting at a pattern that might not have been on the radar of researchers prior. Thanks, Stephanie. Great point. So there's a question from Mary Beth. How can a student go about connecting with other researchers here at MUIH? Stephanie? Funny you should ask that, Mary Beth. <laughs> so, um, there is underway, there's a task force in place now that is creating a proposal for systems at the university to, um, to forge research collaborations between students and faculty, specifically for students to be able to volunteer to participate in um, faculty research projects in order to gain experience and, and learn from that, um, that volunteer effort. Um, those parameters don't yet exist. You should keep an eye out for them, you know, probably in the next year. In the meantime, it's more informal in most departments. I would say that there are pockets of students who are doing research with faculty members. And so if you have an interest in research and you're interested in playing a role in faculty research efforts, and these don't necessarily need to be big trials. This can be, there's a faculty member who's doing a lit review. There's a faculty member who's writing up a case report and getting involved with that is a way to learn about the process, get some mentoring and get experience. Approach the faculty in your department who are doing research um, or who have research backgrounds and ask them if there's anything they're working on where they could use a little bit of support or assistance. So it's a win-win where the faculty gets another, you know, mind and um, perspective and set of hands and the, the student gets some experience. Um, and also their student journal club and there have been students who have volunteer to work with a faculty member on preparing a paper for presentation. So a great way to learn about research and sort of dip your toe into figuring out what your own research might look like down the road is to present a paper. And so you might reach out to a faculty member about that and say, hey, I'd really like to present at Student Journal Club. Would you work with me on it? Um, and Daryl says, want me to provide the link so they can pilot it. Oh, the, <laughs> no, not yet. There will be a form that's available for students to volunteer, to um, offer themselves up as potential volunteers and for faculty to uh, promote projects that they're working on where they're looking for volunteers. We're still in the process of working out the kinks, but stay tuned for that. Yeah, Emily in. has a Emily had a question for you. Um, can you speak to the opportunity that the research symposium offers in line with what we've discussed today? Yeah, great point. So um, the research symposium is an opportunity for students, alumni, and faculty to present their research. It's a little bit low stakes because it's just for an MUIH audience and you don't have to write up a whole paper for a peer reviewed journal. It starts with an abstract and then a poster. And the categories are case reports, as Liz mentioned, literature reviews that we've been talking about, research designs. So you don't even have to execute a study, you can come up with a study that you're interested in doing, and then at the research symposium, get feedback in order to hone and refine it for future execution. And then the last is original research. So the poster session is an opportunity for you as students or faculty or alums to come and bring your work and share it and get feedback on it before you even go through the process of writing it up for peer review. I hope that answers the question. And Daryl just shared the link to Student Journal Club. So for those of you who haven't um, attended, please consider coming. And for those of you who might wanna present, reach out to a faculty member about that. Michael, was there something you wanted to add? Sure, we, we, you've, we've discussed this. We're setting up a volunteer um, option in the herbal arena 
And this is a way you can link with a faculty member in the herb program that's doing a poster for research symposium. It's part of, usually it's part of an ongoing project they're involved in. And you can get involved for uh, two different trimesters in the actual project itself and then show up, you know, get your name on it and becomes part of your publications. Um, and we are in the process of trying to design a, uh, a lab-based structure. And I won't go into much detail because I can't promise anything. It's still in construction and I'm still working with um, James and with Stephanie to figure out how it sits into the larger scheme of things. But I think we're, there are a number of efforts trying to create um, more formal labs on campus where students can then come to them both virtually and in person, identify faculty projects associated with that lab, and then uh, make inquiries into how they could be part of that. And that's certainly cross uh, discipline too. So if there's students in different disciplines that are really interested in the herb piece uh, that want to pursue that, I think that's something where uh, you can extend your learning. Thank you. I'm, so I'm wondering, is there anything more that either of you wanted to say before we wrap up? Um, I'll just say that, I, which I think has already been stated, but reiterate that I think all of us are available. If you have questions, if you have ideas, if you're not sure where to go or, or what to do next, given you know what what you know so far please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us we're we're more than willing to support you thanks stephanie um, well gibson, i learned a lot in this michael did you want to say something yeah gibson bubba and mickey all said hey <laughs> and we say hey too and we also say woof and um That's mary beth off. had to leave So we've gone through a day of putting together teams, understanding your population, what an IRB is. Uh, how it informs that in your research. You're always look back at other research and seeing how other people do it. Um, Michael and Stephanie both told us about some of the pitfalls when you don't design it properly. We learned about really what are the standards when you're doing herbal research and resources when you're looking at, at putting together different kinds of research. Um, so this re really gave us a good overview of kind of how to think about research and then how you might be able to jump in. So I think speaking from all of us, we hope that you will want to become more involved doing research at MUIH as our tiny but growing research projects um, start to mushroom out and as the opportunity for small grants start coming our way. So thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to be with us and we really appreciate you for being here. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Stephanie, Michael, or me. Thanks so much and thanks everybody for being here. Thanks, thanks. Michael. And thanks Stephanie. guys. Thank you. Thanks for facilitating Liz. Yeah. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. <laughs> so weird, I can't stop the recording.